Thank you once again, Brett. That's a, once again an honor to be here. Thank you for coming back for day two. Uh, Norm Breslow was indeed a very dear friend. Uh, we had collaborations both scientifically and non-scientifically. We had three treks in Nepal, probably 10 different ski trips to the British Columbia Coast Range and innumerable trips to the Cascades for what we call ski mountaineering. Anyway, he was a very dear friend and colleague and a very wise and gentle man. So today I'd like to talk about um, non-parametric estimation of S concave and log concave densities and some alternatives to maximum likelihood. So my talk this summer in Seattle was something about maximum likelihood, the ugly, the bad, and the good. And um, Maximum likelihood is one of these things that has become so enshrined in our statistical uh, folklore and basic methods that it has uh, verged on becoming dogma. And it's very easy to become captive to maximum likelihood, even when it is not always the best thing to do. And I'm guilty of this myself. And uh, I'll try to let you know where I'm more guilty than other places here during this talk. But this is a, a talk about pros and cons for maximum likelihood. And it's not always the best thing. So this talk is based on joint work with a whole bunch of younger people. Uh, a lot of this talk is based on work with uh, Roy Hahn at the University of Washington. He's one of our current graduate students. Charles Doss, who is a post former graduate student at the University of Washington now at Minnesota, known to some of you here, I believe. Um, this is Fatwa Balab Dawi, who is another PhD student at the University of Washington. That's Kasper Rufabach, who is a student of Lutz Dumkins in Bern, Switzerland. And Arsini Saragan, who is another PhD student of mine at the University of Washington. All these people have helped me understand this material and uh, been a great spur to research. And their enthusiasm is partly the reason I'm able to talk about this today, I must confess. So I'm going to talk about log concave densities, log concave and S concave densities on R and RD. And then uh, more about S concave in particular, maximum likelihood for estimation for these densities. And then uh, an alternative maximum likelihood, which is based on Rényi divergences. So in all, uh, both cases, both log concave and S concave, we're going to talk about uh, basics of the estimation procedure and then how one has behavior on the model and off the model. When the shape constraint is true and when it is not true. Okay. So feel free to interrupt me this afternoon. We're a relatively small group and not feeling, uh, please do feel free to break in with questions if you have them. So a log concave density, what is it? Well, uh, F is called log concave if it's e to a function phi that's concave or e to the minus, minus phi, and minus phi of course is then convex. So you can view it either way. And I tend to go back and forth depending upon conveniences. Sometimes it's easiest to deal with a convex function. Sometimes it's easiest to deal with concave. And it's equivalent. No sweat. OK. So uh, P0 is what we're going to call this class. That's the notation for all these guys. And. Uh, Here are some of the basic properties. Every log concave density is unimodal or quasi-concave. Uh, this class is closed under convolution. It's closed under marginalization. It's closed under weak limits. 
It's closed under affine transforms, on and on. And a density F on R is log concave, if and only if its convolution with any unimodal density is again unimodal. And that is close to the starting point of this whole theory. That was uh, proved in the paper by Ildar Ibrahimov in the 50s. Uh, Ildar was, in doing that theory, was correcting some misapprehensions about convolutions of unimodal. And the initial statements were unimodal, convolved with unimodal, is again unimodal. And that turns out to be false. You can have unimodal, unimodal, convolved, and it isn't unimodal anymore. Um, so Ildar set that straight, and then things took off from there. So what class of parametric densities do you think about when you have all those preservation problems or properties? Well, Gaussian, right? Gaussian. So this is a generalization of the Gaussian family that is non-parametric rather than parametric. So it's a, it's a non-parametric, very natural generalization of Gaussianity. And that's why it's so appealing and so useful, potentially, and yet it's much bigger. So many parametric families are indeed log concave. Normal is certainly log concave, but uniform is log concave. Uniform on AB. Gamma R lambda for R bigger than one is log concave. Beta AB for A and B bigger than one is log concave. T densities are not log concave. So heavy tailed going down as a power it is not log concave. And that's one of the big uh, differences, one of the distinctions. Uh, all the log concave densities are necessarily sub-exponential. They have to be going down at least exponentially fast. Okay, so uh, another terminology that's often used, at least on the real line, is the class of polya frequency functions of order two or PF2. And this is uh, in the terminology of Schoenberg in 1952 uh, and Carlin 68. And there's very nice treatment in Marshall and Olkin, uh, chapter 18. And there's a wonderful summary of all of this stuff, uh, or most of this stuff, in Darha Medikari and Jagdev, uh, their 88 book. Well, that's a starting point. Um, S concave densities, how do they differ? Well, they are not exponential of something, but they're a power transform, is concave or convex. So if F is of the form e to the minus phi with phi convex, that's long concave. That's the S equals zero case. If they're of the form, 1 over s power of phi, where phi is convex, and s is negative, that's s concave. Or if it's concave to the power 1 over s, if s is positive, then that's s concave. And this, uh, these families of densities go as follows. They're nested in that uh, for r, Bigger than zero, it's a smaller class. It's contained in the log concave class. And when S is less than zero on the negative side, then that's contained in P minus infinity. It's bigger than log concave, and it's contained in P minus infinity, which is all the quasi-concave densities. So you get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go off on the negative S axis. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <clears throat> uh, the S concave classes don't have quite as nice preservation properties, but it is true that every S concave density is quasi concave. This is unimodal essentially. One peak, one bump, no side bumps. Uh, the T densities are all S concave with S 
being less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over 1 plus the degrees of freedom. So all those T guys are in there. And the Cauchy density in particular, which is T1, is in P minus a half, which is contained in PS for S less than or equal to minus a half. So Cauchy is exactly at S equals minus a half. And as you go down further, you get classes that are bigger and contains T with one degree of freedom. Okay. You go with higher degrees of freedom, they go down toward log concave or zero. So higher degrees of freedom will get you closer to log concave. They do have closure properties and interesting closure properties. I've, I won't try to state them here, but this is very much related to what's called the burrell brasskamp lieb inequality and Procopa's lemma. This is a generalization of Procopa. Uh, if you have three functions, f, g, and h, uh, mapping rd to zero infinity, and they're integrable, you have this inequality, which is kind of a convexity inequality, but this is the mean of order s of f, g, with interpolation constant lambda. Here's the mean of order s. M0 is product. That corresponds to log concave. You have this ordering of h and f and g with the mean of order s. Then you have integrals of h bigger than the s over sd plus 1 mean of the integral of f, integral of g. Now that's sort of an abstract thing, but it's relating, it's relating densities, g and h, to measures, the integrals thereof. And so it allows you to go back and forth between the density level and the measure level. If you start thinking putting indicator functions in here um, and integrating just over a set, then you get probability of the set. Anyway, that's a very fundamental inequality in this whole theory, and that has been given this name for these famous people, people Burrell, Brasskamp, and Lieb, and the work on their work on this back in the 70s. And there was a lot of activity in the probability world on these classes in the 1970s. And some of it was by the math physics folks, Brasskamp and Lieb, and other parts of it were in uh, the pure probability group, probability world, Burrell in particular, in Sweden. <coughs> so, um, just to get a little better sense of what's going on here, uh, if f is an s concave function, and s is bigger than minus 1 over d plus 1, so that's closer to 0, then the mean is finite. Uh, if f is in this class and s is bigger than minus 1 over d, then uh, the uniform norm of the density is finite. So the density is bounded in that case. Uh, if f is in this class and s is bigger, whoops, let me go back up here. If f is log concave, then for some a and b, we have uh, an exponential bound on the tail. And so that has to do with the sub-exponentiality of uh, log concave. And so uh, if we're s concave and s is bigger than minus 1 over d, then uh, with r being minus 1 over s bigger than d, f is bounded by this rth power of the norm of x. So we get this sort of decay at rate, how far are we out, how far we are out to that point, to the rth power. On the other hand, if s is less than minus 1 over d, then there exists an f in there with, uh, well, the uniform norm, the maximum being infinity. So we can have the density going off to infinity for really small s's. If s is between minus 1 over d and minus 1 over d plus 1, then there is a guy in here with mean infinite. So if you get s too small, these classes get big. You can have infinite means, or you can be blowing up. Uh, tails can be getting thick, or you can be spiking. 
and the classes are just getting too big. Okay, they're getting really big as you go down. So here's a picture of a T density uh, with R, the degrees of freedom, not an integer, but 0.05. So we can form T densities with non-integer degrees of freedom, right? That's easy. We know how to do that. Uh, there's the form of the density. And here's what it looks like. Well, we know that T's are uh, heavy-tailed. Here the, the decay of the tail is essentially X to the 1 plus R. It's going down just a little bit faster than one. It's just barely integrable, right, in some sense. And you'll see that's starting to spike up maybe a little bit at zero. But actually, as you go down in R, what happens is these T densities, they actually get smaller in the middle, and the mass goes out to the tail. So if you think about it as, as R changes, the picture starts looking like this with higher degrees of freedom up toward the top, and that's looking more like Gaussian, and lower degrees of freedom toward the bottom. And they actually cross out there in the tail beyond where I've plotted, and the mass is all out in the tail. And the mass just floats out. Okay. So here's an extreme case. Um, this is a symmet symmetrized gamma density with a gamma parameter, the shape parameter, being just one half. Okay, so it's symmetrized gamma with shape parameter being a half. That just goes rocketing off to infinity, and it still is S concave with S being minus two. Okay, so that's an illustration of being unbounded. Okay. And you can well imagine that this might be a problem for maximum likelihood. <laughs> maximum likelihood in this don't interact too well together. So, what about maximum likelihood estimation? And that's uh, the good part of maximum likelihood is that for uh, log concave densities, the MLE simply exists period, the end of story. When n, the sample size, is bigger than dimension plus one, the MLE exists. I don't have to choose a bandwidth. I don't have to choose any tuning parameters. The MLE exists. For me, that's a plus. I know that you and I are going to get the same answer based on the data. You're not going to choose a different tuning parameter because there isn't one. <laughs> We've eliminated that possibility. So the MLEs in these classes are given by simply forming log of density integrated with respect to the empirical. This is just the average. So it's 1 over n times the usual log likelihood. And this is a penalty term um, that's coming from a Lagrangian thinking way of thinking. I want the density to integrate to one. So if I subtract off this integral, uh, that's going to force integrating to one and being a density. And when you write that down, uh, what you get for the S equals zero case is just the concave function integrated with respect to empirical. That's the main term in the likelihood. And then integral of e to the phi. On the other hand, when you write down log likelihood for S negative, you get 1 over S log of minus phi. That's convex. And um, then a penalty term corresponding to the Lagrangian term. Um, and what happens here is that this transform of log interacting with convex uh, is not very natural, unfortunately. It just doesn't mesh right. And so, uh, starting to try to prove existence and uniqueness here, you start running into troubles. And I'll try to say a few more words about that as we go along. But uh, 
log likelihood for S concave with S negative is just, uh, it's not meshing quite right. So the MLEs for log concave exist are unique when N is bigger than D plus one. MLEs for PS exist for S between minus one over D and zero. If N is bigger than D times R over R minus D, where R is minus one over S. Well, what's worrisome there is that as R goes down to D, this denominator gets small. The sample size needed for this thing to exist goes scooting off to infinity. Whoops. I thought this was a neat result when we first got it and this Arsini Saragin proved this. I thought that was pretty cool. We can pin down when this estimator exists. Later, as I think about this, this is a warning sign. This is saying uh, likelihood estimation for S concave is unstable and that I need increasingly more data just for the thing to exist when I come down to this barrier. R being close to D is trouble. Okay. Well, I don't know that I can prove uniqueness. And in fact, I think I can prove now that it's not unique. Um, I think I have examples where it's not unique. But um, it is piecewise affine. So it is just uh, the estimate of the concave or convex function is just uh, the minimum of a whole bunch of hyperplanes. And so it's piecewise affine. Um, we know that the MLE for the S concave does not exist if S is less than minus one over D. And that was well known for R equals one and S being minus infinity for a long, long time. So in one dimension, people have tried to estimate unimodal densities uh, and learned that maximum likelihood doesn't work. And so there are a whole bunch of ad hoc solutions uh, for S being minus infinity, all the minimodals, and D being one. And you can start naming them off. Lucien Berger has one, Bickel and Fon have another. Um, the just list goes on and on. There must be 10 different alternative estimators that are more or less ad hoc for unimodal. So um, anyway, yes, sure. Well, I, I yeah. <laughs> Well, there is as long as you keep S um, bigger than minus one over D. And the estimator is going to correspond to the closest you're going to go down to minus one over D, that biggest thing in your class. Because these are null nested. So I, I don't regard it as a tuning parameter in the same way that you think about a bandwidth. It does control the size of the class, uh, but it's the size of the class, not in the sense of a degree of smoothness, but it's uh, in the degree of trade-off between tails and boundedness. That's the way I'm thinking about it. That may not be completely accurate either. And uh, other people, when I've given this talk, Richard Samworth in particular in Cambridge has asked the question, how do I choose S based on the data? And indeed, that might be a subject for future research. I am avoiding that at the moment. I don't think I want to choose S based on the data. <laughs> I think I want to choose S being minus a half in one dimension or Something like that. Um, well, on the model, let me try to go to the behavior of these estimators when the model is true. Um, 
The MLEs are Hellinger and L1 consistent. That much we know from work of um, Woodruff and uh, students at Michigan, Mary Meyer. But the log concaves also satisfy a weighted L1 convergence where the weights are exponential and the parameter A in this exponential weight is anything smaller than A0 where A0 governs the decay of F0. So we can actually blow up the L1 distances and weight them exponentially and still have convergence. That's uh, due to Richard Samworth and Madeline Cool in Cambridge. Um, and uh, I claim that the S concave MLEs are computationally awkward. Log is too aggressive a transform for S concave. Um, the maximum likelihood method even has difficulties for all the T densities and just thinking about location families of T. So Cauchy location, if you think about that. We all know that the likelihood equations have multiple roots. Uh, we don't have uniqueness of roots anyway. We may have a unique maximum likelihood for Cauchy, but it's hard to find. You have to work hard. And uh, so all those location families are always embedded in their uh, T families with non-monotone scores and so forth. So it's awkward. Uh, we do have pointwise distribution theory for the MLE of the log concave when D is 1. We have no pointwise distribution theory for uh, the MLE for S concave even when D is 1. Um, there's no pointwise distribution theory anywhere when D is strictly bigger than 1. We don't know what the limit in distributions are at pointwise. Sorry, still unknown. Global rates, well, we do have uh, n to the minus two-fifths rates for Hellinger convergence for S concave in one dimension down to S being minus one, strictly bigger. And that's a result uh, with Charles Doss that took a lot of work and uh, sweat. And uh, we finally got it. Um, Richard Samworth and Arlene Kim at Cambridge uh, now have rates for Hellinger distance for uh, log concave MLE in dimensions higher than one. And they can tell you what the rate is here uh, when D is two or three, <laughs> but not four or greater. And so four and greater, they ran into hurdles having to do with convex geometry and covering numbers. How many polytopes can you squeeze in certain sets? And it depends very much on the boundary behavior of convex functions. What's, what is the domain? So global rates, we're still learning things. We have things uh, pretty well understood in one dimension. Uh, we have things understood for S being zero for dimensions two and three, um, but uh, still lots of room for improvements here. Off the model. Well, now suppose Q is an arbitrary probability measure on RD uh, with density Q, and these guys are IIDQ. Now, I'm not assuming that Q is log concave or S concave. Um, but let's think about the MLE for log concave. Well, what happens is that it is L1 consistent for a density F star, which is the kohlbach leibler closest guy to the true Q. So we actually do converge to a pseudo true thing F star, and that pseudo true density is the closest thing in the log concave class to this guy Q, which is outside in kohlbach leibler sense. And this makes sense from what we know about parametric models. This is what typically happens for parametric maximum likelihood if you really do maximize the likelihood under misspecification. Moreover, um, Richard and colleagues 
have proved um, we have exponentially weighted versions of that L1 convergence as we had before on the model. And um, actually even more than that, um, I don't even have to have a density here Q of the data as long as I have a Q which has a finite mean and it has a support with convex hull that is when you take the support and convexify it and close it, it has to include um, a simplex. So very, very, under very, very weak conditions on the underlying measure, we actually have behavior like this where this is still the closest thing in some sense within the model. And those are remarkable stability theorems. And that's what was the good part of my talk in Seattle this summer. The stability property of maximum likelihood in the log concave case is remarkable. It's just a wonderful stability property. You can actually extend a long ways off the model, off the data, and still have something that we are estimating that's playing the role of the closest fellow. Well, I claim that the MLE for log con, uh, S concave does not behave well off the model. If you start retracing the basic arguments of Kuhl and Samworth in terms of consistency, one starts seeing uh, negative things. Um, and uh, how negative remains to be pinned down, and I'm still working on this, trying to figure out exactly in what sense this instability works. It seems that there is a pseudo-true thing. If the true density, if the true distribution has a density, then there is a pseudo-true. Uh, but um, there's not nearly the same degree of, of stability and continuity off the model. It starts getting uh, ill-behaved. So anyway, that together with the sample size uh, conclusion with Arsini, uh, leads me to say, well, let's think about alternative methods in these larger classes. Why not think about alternatives to maximum likelihood? And uh, fortunately enough, uh, that's already been thought a bit about a little bit by Roger Conker and Even Mizera. Mizera, not quite sure how to pronounce Even's name, but uh, about five years ago, they proposed. Renyi divergence estimators. And so the way these go are as follows. Uh, suppose that beta is 1 plus 1 over S is negative. S is still the, S, the index of S concavity. Suppose that alpha and is conjugate to beta in the usual sense. Uh, let Cx be all the continuous functions on the convex hull of the data. So here that is a vector of vectors. So here by that underlying x, I mean things in Rd, and I put x1 as a first vector, and then x2 as a second vector up to xn. And they're all got n vectors in Rd. And I form the convex hull of those n vectors in Rd. C stars all signed radon measures on that set continuous functions, that's the dual space. G of X is all closed, convex, lower semi-continuous functions on the convex hull. GX zero is all the G's in C star, the radon measures, that have this integral property for all G in uh, closed convex. And this is the polar or dual cone. So this is optimization theory stuff, um, cones related to optimization problems. And uh, Roger and Even set this up very nicely and studied these duality issues connected with the following optimization problems. So here for log concave, we've seen this before, uh, let L0 of G and Pn be Pn of G plus x of minus g. Well, that was just um, 
what we had is the criterion for log concave, and here G is the convex function, and I've switched some minus signs. So we want to minimize that guy. Um, empirical measure of the G plus this penalty that will get us integ uh, integrating to one. On the other hand, the corresponding primal problem for S concave is, um, well, LS GPN is PN of G. Well, that's common, and that's a nice feature. Plus one over beta integral of GX to the beta DX. Well, I claim this is the right penalty to make things fit right, even though you might not think so at first glance. Um, and so here we've formulated two minimization problems, which are going to lead to estimators. The second of which, in these S concave classes, this is not going to be the MLE. It's going to be something different. So the dual problems uh, for the log concave case, this is maximum over F of something that is called Shannon entropy. That's related to kolbach leibler of course. kolbach leibler divergence and Shannon entropy are very close. Um, but then subject to a very funny looking condition, F of Y being uh, derivative or density of PN minus G dy for some G in the polar cone. And you stare at that at first and it looks crazy because I've got PN, which is a discrete measure, and I'm asking for a density. But roughly speaking, there has to be a function G that compensates for the empirical and puts in something nice that has a derivative. And you pull that out, and you've got the answer. Anyway, when you first stare at this, it looks absolutely crazy. But that's the dual problem. And in the S concave place, we're maximizing integral of f to the alpha divided by alpha subject to a similar condition uh, related to the polar cone. Okay, well, that's cool. This is a Renyi-type divergence as a close or a Renyi-type entropy as compared to a Shannon entropy. Okay, so that's why I call these Renyi divergence, even though I haven't written down a divergence per se. There's a Renyi entropy, at least, involved. Well, here's just my simple-minded way of making sure that these make sense. So bear with me just for a moment. This is very simple-minded. This is not nearly as fancy as what Roger and even were suggesting. Uh, but I think about the population version of P0, minimum of this guy, uh, where F0 is in the class. So I'm supposing now that F0 is going to be log concave. I'm going to stick it into this criterion. I'm going to think about minimizing the resulting integrand pointwise. Does, does this make sense pointwise? Do I get back the right answer? And when you do that, you think about minimizing it pointwise in G for fixed F0 of X, and you differentiate with respect to G, and you get this, and that's 0 if these are equal. Oh. Lo and behold, that's the right answer. So this is Fisher consistency in the optimization problem in the population. What I'm really doing is getting at a simple-minded approach to Fisher consistency. Similarly, the population version of the problem, the primal problem for these Renyi divergences, you write down an integral, this is what it is. You try to minimize that integrand pointwise in G for fixed F0x. And lo and behold, it works out like a charm. Again, you've got something that's nicely convex, and you get the right answer. Bingo. That's very promising. Even though it's simple-minded, I haven't done any fancy optimization theory there. I'm just minimizing pointwise under the integral. But this is proving Fisher consistency when the model is true, it actually proves you're going to get the right thing. <clears throat> so, Kunker and Mazera, Roger and even uh, proved that this has non empty interior, convex holds data, then strong duality holds between the primal problems and the dual problems. The dual optimal solution exists, is unique, and you've got the right answer. 
The convex function is related to a density. Similarly, um, under log concavity, well, this is always the right thing. Uh, you have density, you have Fisher consistency. So this is what I was more or less indicating by doing a pointwise minimization on the previous page. <clears throat> okay, so um, Roy Hahn and I got interested in trying to study the properties of these estimators that uh, uh, Roger and Even had proposed. We wanted to know more about them. Um, Roger and Even set up these very nice existence. They studied the optimization problems. The estimates exist. They uh, started to compute them a little bit, but didn't get very far with that. Uh, and we wanted to know more about the properties. Could we extend and get some of the properties analogous to what uh, Richard Samworth and his colleagues had proved in the SCON cave MLE case? So here, let uh, script Q1 be Qs on RD with a finite mean. Let Q0 be the Qs on RD with the interior of the convex hull of the support, Q being non-empty. And our first uh, result is that if S is between minus 1 over D plus 1 and Q uh, is in the intersection of those two classes, it's in both, then the primal problem has a unique solution, G tilde. It's connected to a density by the right formula. This guy is bounded away from zero, and this is a bounded density. So that's studying the optimization problem from the perspective of robustness. If I put in a Q that's pretty arbitrary, just a finite mean and um, having uh, interior of its convex hull being non-empty, support being non-empty, do I have a well-defined thing? And the answer is, promisingly, yes, we do. There's a great deal of stability here in this optimization problem. The second theorem is in the case D equals one. Uh, if we fix the data, and this is the S concave uh, solution to the primal problem, and if Fn zero is the solution to the primal problem P zero, so that's the log concave MLE, if you will. Then for any kappa positive P greater than or equal to one, we have a weighted L1 convergence for fixed data as S converges uh, up to zero. So S is negative and it's gonna come up to zero and the solutions are actually continuous and we're getting agreement of the solutions of the optimization problems. So we can recover log concave MLE as a limit of S concave Renyi divergence guys. Okay. Right there. Yeah, got to have that thing be negative. Mm -hmm. So the weighting here is not as severe or not as great as uh, we were seeing uh, in the log concave setting. Here it's just a power of x and we're in one dimension here. We haven't succeeded in proving this in higher dimensions. Uh, I suspect this is true in higher dimensions as well. That if I had this in D dimensions, this assertion should be true as well but with norms there. Haven't succeeded in proving that yet. I'd like to have that continuity as well. Not yet there. Uh, here's yet another result. If D is bigger than or equal to one, S is between minus uh, one over D plus one and zero. Q is in the intersection of those two classes of measures. And this is the pseudo true solution to the primal problem. Then for any kappa less than R minus D, so the gap between R and D, well, we can wait by that much in an L1 convergence. And the Renyi divergence estimator is converging to that pseudo true guy, which we know exists. 
in a weighted L1 sense. We can't wait very much, and the, way, the amount of weighting we can do depends upon how far D is below R. Okay, well, back on the model, things are nice still. And uh, we can go down a little bit further if we're on the model. So uh, before, up to this point, I've had S bigger than minus 1 over D plus 1. Here I can go down to minus 1 over D. And suppose, suppose that uh, I'm in that setting. I have an S prime bigger than S. Uh, well, if S is smaller than minus 1 over D plus 1 uh, and S prime is equal to F, S if S is bigger than that, uh, then for any kappa smaller than that gap, uh, we can have still um, this Renyi divergence guy, weighted L1 convergence to the truth. So here I'm saying I'm on the model, but I've now I've extended the range over which I'm getting consistency, at least on the model, and it's weighted L1. Okay. So that means that Hellinger convergence happens as well. Um, and we don't know very much. We don't know anything about the rates there yet. Uh, the rates of convergence for log concave that... Uh, Charles and I proved uh, were very much dependent upon the nice results of Birger and Lassart in the mid-90s, uh, Wong and Shen, but their results relating uh, Hellinger metric sizes of classes of densities, Hellinger balls to MLE. And here I need something connecting Hellinger balls not to maximum likelihood criteria, but to this Renyi divergence criteria. And so it's another place where uh, we're still lacking empirical process tools. We don't have the right connection in the empirical process theory linking Hellinger, some nice measure of the size of balls in the density space, to the behavior of the empiricals via the contrast function. And so we don't know yet the rates of convergence uh, they should correspond. I conjecture that they would correspond to what we already know for the log concave phase, what we know from convexity theory. That's still unknown. Uh, the point-wise limit theory uh, is something that Roy and I did succeed in doing, uh, paralleling what I did with Fadua and Casper in 2009 in the log concave case. So uh, this is a little bit technical. Bear with me. Uh, suppose I have a density or a convex function and a corresponding density in the S concave class with S bigger than minus a half. This is in one dimension. Suppose the density is positive at that point uh, and I've got a um, second derivative locally in a neighborhood of this point and that convex function is strictly convex there. I've got curvature. Well, in that case, um, we were su successful in proving that the convex function estimator, according to the Renyi divergence scheme, converges at a rate n to the two-fifths to the truth at that point, and correspondingly jointly for the derivative, first derivative of the estimator, at the rate n to the one-fifth. And we get convergence in distribution to complicated constants depending upon derivatives and the function values. The times things that are universal over here, and this is uh, where the complications come in. It's a little bit hard to explain this. But this is uh, the second derivative at zero of the envelope of integrated two-sided Brownian motion uh, plus or minus t to the fourth, depending upon which way you rig it. Um, so most of you will not have understood any of that. Expect, uh, and but this is a theory that was developed for convex decreasing densities. It's corresponding to what we did for convex decreasing densities with Pete Kurbom and Kurt Youngblood, 
uh, in 2001 or so. And it took two papers in the annals to uh, describe what went on there point-wise. And this, uh, these universal distributions connected to Brownian motion arose in those papers. And uh, they arise again in estimating convex functions according to a different scheme, but we're still using non-parametric estimation. Now, if I had a blackboard, I would maybe draw another picture but, or two, but uh, I, since I don't, I can't draw another picture or two. Uh, the simpler version of this is for monotone densities. And uh, for monotone densities, what one gets over here is first derivative. So the limit process in the Gaussian world for monotone decreasing density uh, is two-sided Brownian motion minus a parabola. So you're going to have to imagine a blackboard. Brownian motion goes off this way. Brownian motion goes off this way. These two are independent. Uh, put those two together. That's two-sided Brownian motion. Pull it down by a parabola. Subtract t squared. Subtract t squared. So here's two-sided Brownian motion minus a parabola. That process is drifting down. And so if I stretch a string across the top of it, there is a greatest or a least concave majorant. So I stretch a string across the top. Look at the slope of that process at zero. That corresponds to what one does in the finite sample world for estimating a decreasing density point-wise. What you do in the finite sample world for estimating a decreasing density is you take the empirical distribution of the data, you stretch a string across the top, and you differentiate it. And that's the Grenander estimator of a decreasing density. Well, you do, there's an invariance principle here. You do exactly the same thing in the limit Gaussian world as you do in the finite sample world in that monotone estimation problem. You do some cumulative thing. You stretch something with the right shape around it, in this case, concave. You differentiate it. Differential of concave gives decreasing. Okay. In this world, it's more complicated. I have to integrate twice. I integrate twice, differentiate back twice. So I integrate twice up to get something cumulative. I get integrated Brownian motion. The cumulative also integrated twice. Well, I start with a t squared. That's the canonical convex function. Canonical convex in the Gaussian world is t squared. I integrate it twice. I'm up to t to the fourth. Oh, if I'm concave, I go down. So I have integrated Brownian motion minus t to the fourth. I form something below that now, which is the right shape in that it's an integral twice of something convex. Oh, I have to differentiate back. Anyway, maybe you get the drift. Furthermore, one has the same convergence at the density level and the two-fifths and the one-fifths. Each two is a unique, unique lower envelope of the process Y2 satisfying that. Here's Y2 is integrated Brownian motion minus T to the fourth, two-sided. Okay, so anyway, we know the description of that limit and we have this convergence. And uh, then one starts wondering, how does this compare to uh, what one would get for log concave if, in fact, I've assumed S concave with S negative. I've done the thing for the bigger class, but the truth was really log concave. I could have gotten away with log concave, the smaller class. And so how much have I lost by enlarging the class to S concave for estimation at a point if the truth is really log concave? Uh-huh. So how much have I really lost? So that's kind of an interesting question. Uh, first, for estimating the mode, I do know a limit theorem also for estimating the mode. The mode of this Renyi divergence guy in one dimension converges at rate n to the one-fifth. 
Again, a cons constant that's complicated. And then the mode of that process, H2 second derivative. So that's a very beautiful limit theorem, I believe, because there's invariance there on both sides. Mode, mode, mode. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> uh, so how about this price of estimating, assuming S less than zero and the truth is log concave? Well, um, suppose we're down there, K is two, so that's two derivatives. Suppose I'm really log concave. Uh, well, then it's also S concave because we're nested. So it's in the bigger class that's S concave. The truth is really log concave. What did we lose? Well, uh, some calculation shows that the uh, G corresponding to the S concave is related. Um, take two derivatives. It's related to the phi zero that's true this way. And so the constant before this guy appearing in the limit uh, becomes this. Well, that's just algebra and working with these constants that appear in these two limit distributions. And I didn't write down separately what appears for log concave, but there it is. That is it by itself. And so this is the penalty term for assuming S concave when I really had log concave. And so the second term is the constant involved in limiting distribution when F0 is estimated via the log concave MLE. That's in this paper in 2009. The ratio of the two constants or asymptotic relative efficiency is shown for F0 being standard normal, logistic, in the following figure. Okay, so uh, one of those magenta is logistic, standard normal is blue. And at the mode, Zero, we didn't lose anything. And we start losing more and more as we go out to the tails. Well, that's pretty natural because that's where the bigger class gives us less uh, information. We have less information about estimating the tail in the bigger class. And so it's pretty natural that uh, we should expect this to drop off as we go out. But it hasn't dropped off too much. Here we're at still at 0.6 out. Uh, when we're out at uh, three or four, roughly three. And, uh, well, we're losing something, but not a huge amount by using the S concave when the log concave is really true. And in fact, for estimating the mode, um, well, so the first term is non negative, is the price we pay for estimating this guy. It vanishes as R goes to infinity or S goes to zero. That's in the right spirit. The ratio is one at the mode. And for estimation of the mode, the ratio of constants is always one and nothing is lost. So that's kind of a reassurance. I can, I'm not paying too big a price by going down to S negative for estimating a point or for estimating the mode. That's the bulk of my talk. Global rates of convergence, I mentioned that problem. We don't know how to do it. We don't have the tools yet in the empirical process theory. Uh, limiting distributions for D bigger than one, point-wise. Um, well, I suspect that the MLE itself is rate inefficient for D larger than four, if perhaps if D is, whoops, sorry. Perhaps when D is even bigger than three, uh, Minimal contrast estimators in high dimensions are rate inefficient. And we've known this since Birger and Massart, and this is one example of it. Uh, again, in higher dimensions, minimal contrast estimators of any kind, I don't care if you give me a Renyi or if maximum likelihood, they're going to be rate inefficient. That's yet to be proved precisely in this class, but it's bound to be the case. Uh, can we go below? minus one over D plus one with other methods. I don't know yet. Uh, in general, I'd like to have multivariate classes with nice preservation or uh, closure properties uh, that are smoother than log concave. I don't know these things yet. Don't have easy handles on such things. Algorithms for computing. 
Um, at the present time, uh, Richard and his colleagues in Cambridge are using Shor's R algorithm to compute the log concave MLE. It uh, seems to work fine up to D is three. When D is four or more, it starts bogging down. It's very interesting that there seems to be a correspondence between computing these things and between um, the theory. We don't have good theory for D bigger than four. Uh, there are some related results for convex regression uh, by Sayo and Sen in the annals in 2011. Uh, there's a lot there we don't know. And I'm in the midst of further research on that topic with Roy Hong. And uh, we're trying to learn more about how convex regression works rather than convex density or log concave densities. Just to close here, here's uh, a data set, a little bit of plot, few plots from a data set. This is from Roger Conker and one of his colleagues in um, econometrics. Uh, this is a large data set of income changes. It's a 10% sample of US Social Security records linked to W2 data. The density uh, is not log concave. This is a raw histogram kernel type estimator uh, with a log transform, and uh, it doesn't look too concave to me. On the other hand, if you do um, uh, a power transform, S is minus a half of that same density, you get this picture, that looks pretty concave. Um, so, anyway, um, I think a lot of data is not going to fit log concave very well, especially when we get to heavy tailed stuff. And we really do need to allow for heavy tails in non parametric methods. And these S concave classes give us a way to do this uh, one way. Um, so that's not looking too bad. There are some of the references, um, papers by some of these folks. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here these two days and uh, talk about some of my favorite subjects. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. issues too much yet, to be honest, and i um, mostly been un trying to understand what the procedures do once you fix an S. And so um, let me just say that I think some of those are interesting questions which are probably need some future work. You know, I don't regard it as a tuning parameter in the same way. Uh, at least that's the way, not the way I'm thinking about it. 